So we're in book one, the book of beginnings, canto three, the yoga of the soul's release. This is Sri Aurobindo describing to us the early stages of King Aswapati's yoga, the first main stage, the yoga of the soul's release. And we've been reading in the last couple of weeks about the effect on King Aswapati and his sadhana of the visits of the goddess of inspiration who has been revealing all kinds of wonderful secret knowledge to him. Those were visits, but now she comes and enters into his being. I'm going to read on from line 696. <coughs> the inspiring goddess entered a mortal's breast, made there her study of divining thought and sanctuary of prophetic speech and sat upon the tripod seat of mind. All was made wide above, all lit below. In darkness core she dug out wells of light on the undiscovered depths imposed a form, lent a vibrant cry to the unuttered vasts, and through great shoreless, voiceless, starless breaths bore earthward fragments of revealing thought hewn from the silence of the ineffable. A voice in the heart uttered the unspoken name. A dream of seeking thought wandering through space entered the invisible and forbidden house. The treasure was found of a supernal day. In the deep subconscious glowed her jewel lamp. Lifted, it showed the riches of the cave where by the miser traffickers of sense unused, guarded beneath night's dragon paws in folds of velvet darkness draped, they sleep whose priceless value could have saved the world. A darkness carrying morning in its breast looked for the eternal wide returning gleam, waiting the advent of a larger ray and rescue of the lost herds of the sun. In a splendid extravagance of the waste of God, dropped carelessly in creation's spendthrift work, left in the shantiers of the bottomless world and stolen by the robbers of the deep, the golden shekels of the eternal lie hoarded from touch 
and view and thought's desire, locked in blind antus of the ignorant flood, lest men should find them and be even as gods. A vision lightened on the viewless heights, a wisdom illumined from the voiceless depths, a deeper interpretation greatened truth, a grand reversal of the night and day. All the world's values changed, heightening life's aim. A wiser word, a larger thought came in than what the slow labor of human mind can bring. A secret sense awoke that could perceive a presence and a greatness everywhere. The universe was not now this voice, this senseless world born round inert on an immense machine. It cast away its grandiose, lifeless front, a mechanism no more, or work of chance, but a living movement of the body of God. A spirit hid in forces and in forms was the spectator of the mobile scene the beauty and the ceaseless miracle let in a glow of the unmanifest, the formless everlasting moved in it, seeking its own perfect form in souls and things. Life kept no more a dull and meaningless shape. In the struggle and upheaval of the world, he saw the labor of a Godhead's birth. A secret knowledge masked as ignorance. Fate covered with an unseen necessity, the game of chance, of an omnipotent will. We'll go back to line 696 and look at each of these sentences in detail. I could ask something. Yes, please, Janaka. In the line 710, or 11, is uh, in the deep subconscious, no? Uh, this is a subconscious Italian, but Italian uh, we use also the word inconscious. There is a difference between yes. conscious and I think yes, but I don't understand how. We use the word the inconscient for what seems to us totally without consciousness. A kind of deep ocean of darkness where there doesn't seem to be any consciousness. We think we associate it with matter, but matter is inconscient. But within our own consciousness there are different levels. There are levels that are super conscient to our mind. They're on higher levels and the mind has to open up in a special way in order to reach those levels that are normally super conscient to us. 
And then we have this surface consciousness where we usually operate, but behind that there's something which Robindo calls the subliminal, an inner mind, inner life, inner physical consciousness. And those open up, those the inner parts of the being open up to the circumconscient, to the consciousness that is around in the environment, in the universe. And below, there's a level that is subconscious. And we can access that subconscious. It is possible to uh, go into sort of inner states and to enter into that uh, deep, what he calls here the deep subconscious. It's not totally inaccessible. So that is on a higher level than what we think of as completely inconscient, incapable of consciousness. Yeah. Which side are we starting today? Uh, no. Martin, you will begin. The inspiring goddess entered a mortal's breast. May there her study of divining thought and sanctuary of prophetic speech and set upon the tripod seat of mind. All was made wide above, all lit below. Yes. So in the previous uh, lines of this section, um, it, the goddess of inspiration has been visiting Aswapati often bringing him all kinds of new knowledge. But now she enters into his human being, makes there her study, her place where she will do her research, her study of divining thought, thought that is not based on reason but on intuition. And that will be her sanctuary of prophetic speech. In ancient temples, there would be sometimes a sanctuary, a special inner secret place where would sit an oracle, somebody who could receive inspiration and share secret knowledge, sometimes in very mysterious language. So here in this sentence, Sri Aurobindo seems to be alluding to the, the famous oracle in Greece, in ancient Greece, in the temple of Apollo in Delphi. There was a, a priestess, the Pythia, she was called. And um, she would go into a trance. And if um, actually the city-states of Greece, their governments used to send delegations to her to ask for her advice if there were important decisions to be made. Or even individuals could do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there in that cave sanctuary, Nowadays, they think that there must have been some special vapors that came up through this volcanic rock, and this would send her into a trance, and then she would give her messages. And as with the, the modern-day uh, uh, state oracle of Tibet, it is the same thing, that oracle is... Uh, goes into a trance and he's asked certain questions and the way that he expresses the answers is not understandable to ordinary people. There has to be somebody who interprets the messages and it was similarly in Delphi that uh, there would be somebody who would interpret the utterances of the priestess. 
And in order to make those prophetic utterances, she used to sit on a three-legged seat. And this tripod, this three-footed uh, thing, was important to the Greeks. They, all their offerings to the gods, they would place on a three-legged stand like that. So it means that when she was seated on that stool, she was in communion with the, with the divine. So here he gives an allusion to that. He says that uh, this ordinary mind of Asvapati becomes the tripod stool for the goddess of inspiration. It's made a sacred seat to receive the utterances of the goddess. So as a result of the inspiration which she brings to Asvapati, all was made wide above. This lid above the mind was removed and there's a vast wideness of superconscience there and she lights up all the deeper, lower and the lower and deeper levels of consciousness. Hmm. Would you like to read? Yes. Um, Line 701. Sure. In darkness is cruel, she dug out wells of light. On the undiscovered depths imposed a form lent a vibrant cry to the unuttered vasts, and through great shoreless, voiceless, starless breaths, bore earth with fragments of revealing form, here from the silence of the mortal. Mm -hmm. So in the very, very heart of darkness of the inconscient, she's able to dig out wells of light. She bores holes and light flows up, hmm? hidden light. And on those undiscovered depths of consciousness and awareness, which seem formless, shapeless, she can give a form. Those vastnesses that are unuttered, which have never been expressed, she can lend them a voice so that they, they express themselves in a vibrant cry. And another thing that she does, does is to carry towards the earth fragments of revealing thought. And she has hewn those fragments as if she's working in a quarry, uh, cutting the hard rock. She has hewn from the silence of the ineffable. The ineffable is that supreme presence which cannot be described or expressed. You know? From that silence of the Supreme, she brings little fragments to Asvapati. She has to carry them a long way through great, shoreless, voiceless, starless breaths. All the vastness of inner space. Mohi, you are ready to read. The chorus in the heart uttered the unspoken name, a dream of seeking thoughts wandering through space, entered the invisible and hidden house. Treasure was found for its eternal day. Yes. So this voice speaks in. Aswapati's heart utters 
the name, the name that usually is not spoken. And by her action, somehow in his consciousness, a dream of seeking thought, a thought that is looking for something. It's wandering through space. It found a house. It found and entered the invisible and forbidden house. I don't know what this house is or where it is. <laughs> we can meditate on it and see if we can find an answer of it. But it seems as if uh, as Aswapati's consciousness enters that house, he finds there a treasure, the treasure of a supernal day, a supreme full light of day. Bhuvana. In the deep subconscious yield and jewel plan, lifted and showed the riches of the king, where, by the miser tractifiers of sand, unused, guarded beneath night's dragon path, in pools of velvet darkness, deep they sleep, whose priceless value would have saved the world. Hmm. So in the subconscious, we are not aware of it. It's like a deep, dark cave. But when the goddess of inspiration lifts up her jewel lamp in that cave, it reveals all the treasures that are there, all these wonderful treasures. They've been hidden there by the miser traffickers of sense. These are the, the beings who are referred to in the, in the Vedas as the, the Dasyus and the Panis. They are the robbers of the deep. Sri Aurobindo connects them with the senses. If we don't uh, offer our sense experiences to the divine if egoistically we take everything for ourselves. Uh, then we become these miser traffickers. We don't use those treasures, we want to keep them for ourselves. And we bargain with them. Traffickers, they are people who do bargaining and um, exchanging. These treasures are unused in that cave. They are being guarded by a dragon, a dragon of night, of darkness, of unconsciousness, we can say, or deliberate darkness. <laughs> So it reminds us of many fairy tales, no? of these secret caves where there are um, wonderful treasures and you can't just uh, take them away because there's a dragon there. He has collected them and he's sitting on them and he won't give them up. Mm -hmm. But there they are lying, in, wrapped up in folds of velvet darkness. They're asleep. All these wonderful treasures, possibilities that are lying in our subconscious of all of us. And if they weren't guarded by a dragon, if they weren't kept there by these miser traffickers, their priceless value could have saved the world the world wouldn't be the difficult place that we experience it to be now. Mm. 
Naren, you've arrived just in time to read. <laughs> the darkness carried morning in its best. Look for the eternal white turning green, feeding the advent of a larger ray and rescue of the lost herds of the sun. Yes. So it's as if uh, when inspiration lifts up her jewel lamp, Aswapati sees that in the darkness of the subconscious there's the possibility of a wonderful dawning, a darkness carrying morning in its breast. This is also, of course, Vedic symbolism, that every night is giving birth to a dawn, and every day is giving birth to a night. Mm -hmm. So this darkness which he sees, holding within it the possibility of morning, is looking for the dawn to come back, the eternal, wide, returning gleam, that wonderful light which brings new knowledge and possibilities with it. And that darkness is waiting for the advent of a larger ray, of brighter, stronger, more powerful ray of consciousness that will enable the rescue of the lost herds of the sun. This again is an allusion to a, a Vedic myth which we can think of as a kind of companion myth to the myth of Savitri and Satyavan. It's the myth of the Angirasas which tells how these Panis and Dasyus, these robbers of the deep, have stolen the cows that belong to the sun. And the cows are the rays of light. The, the word go, it means a ray of light and it also means a cow. So this is this psychological symbolism of the Vedas. These are rays of consciousness and they've been taken captive by these lower forces and hidden away inside a cave. And the Angirasa Rishis, they somehow intuit that those rays must be there, hidden somewhere. And they call for help uh, from the goddess and she sends her, her um, power of intuition, Sarama, who is imaged as a dog, a hunting dog, with a very um, keen nose who can sniff out where the cows have been hidden. So he show, she, Sarama shows the way uh, to where the cows have been hidden, but it's, in, it's a cave inside a great black hill all the rock of the inconscient. So the, the rishis, they have to call for help to the gods. And Indra, the god of mind, comes to their help and utters a very powerful mantra that is so powerful that it shatters that black hill of unconsciousness and the cows can come out. And when the cows come out, it's not only they bring light with them, uh, it also calls down rain from heaven. All the divine energies come pouring down and a great flood of rain and pour into the, the seven great rivers. So there's an allusion here to this, that, that darkness is there in us, waiting 
for that greater dawn to come when all these inner treasures will be released and the higher energies will become active in the world. Apart from that, it's such glorious poetry, you know, these, these lines, pictorial lines. And of course, it makes us think of uh, Alibaba and uh, the robber's cave and, uh, and uh, other stories. Sopa, will you read? In this splendid extravagance of the cosmos of God, Ram carelessly in self creation, spent with God, live in the chandeliers of the cosmos world, and stolen by the robbers of the king, the golden shakers, shakers of the eternal light, further from touch and view and thoughts desire, locked in blind, enter and truth of the ignorant blood, lest men should find them and be even as gods. Yes. So also in that cave are lying these uh, other treasures, the things that have been dropped in the course of creation and the course of evolution, in this splendid extravagant of the waste of God, as if God is so lavish with all his treasures, he doesn't even notice that some of them are getting dropped carelessly in this, uh, um, all this extravagance of energy that he's spending on creation. And they've got dropped and they are left there in the shantiers, the um, construction sites of the bottomless world. Sometimes in dreams you may go down into these uh, construction sites in the subconscious where the world is getting built. Mm -hmm. So there they were, they were just lying and those robbers of the deep have immediately found them and stolen them. These are golden shekels. A shekel is a, um, an old Hebrew word for a big gold coin. And um, these were meant to be offered in the temple, of course. Well, these precious coins of the eternal are lying. And that dragon and those panis and those dasyus are hoarding them, just keeping them hidden not using them, not touching them, not seeing them, and we can't even think of them. Uh, we don't know that they are there at all. No. They are locked up in these blind anters. An anter is also a cave, a dark cave, under, under sea, in the ocean of the inconscient. No. They, they keep them there. Because if human beings would find them, then they would become divine. They would become even as gods. So this is another series of wonderful things that inspiration shows to Aswapati. Uh, Chandra, would you read? A vision centered on the universe heights. A vision illumined from the vastness depths. A deeper interpretation written to a grand universe of the night and day. All the world's values change height to me as a advisor world and love, love, Louder thought came in than what the slow level of human mind can be. A secret sense of it that could be perceived. Perceive. Perceive. The presence and the greatness everywhere. Yes. So, with the help of the goddess in Asvapati, 
a vision lights up on these heights above that we can't see. And even a light comes from below, a wisdom illumined from the voiceless depths. There's not only wisdom on the heights, there's also wisdom hidden deep within. And with that vision and that wisdom, Asvapati can look at the world in a new way, a greater interpret, a, a deeper interpretation, greatened truth. We look and we think, and this is right and that is wrong, this is true and that is false. But the truth can be deepened and greatened. What he sees is a grand reversal of the night and day, as if all the world's values have changed. Everything that he thought was light becomes dark, and what was dark becomes full of light. What seemed true now looks false. What was thought to be false and extravagant seems true. This reversal of consciousness is a very important development in our inner growth. So when this happens to him, when all the world's values changed, heightening life's aim, giving a much deeper and uh, greater meaning to our human life. Hmm? And a wiser word, a larger power of thought came in than what the slow labor of human mind can bring. This is a completely new kind of revelatory consciousness. Even in him a secret sense wakes up so that when he looks around he can see a presence and a greatness everywhere. As one of the mantras Sri Aurobindo has given to his disciples. No? In all things let me see the divine. Then the world's values change completely when we can perceive this presence and this greatness everywhere. Janaka. Yes, was not now this senseless world, born around in the miracle or the endless machine. It cast away its grandiosity, lifeless from the mechanism of more work of chance, but the movement of the body of God. Yes. So this is how we should be able to see the world. Not like this meaningless circling that seems to be carried around helplessly on some vast universal machinery. No? This appearance of being of matter as being something lifeless, unconscious, that's just thrown away like taking off a mask. No? He experiences the universe around him no longer as a mechanism, an enginery, or something that's random and happening by chance. He sees all this material world as a living movement of the body of God. Joel. Spirit hit enforces and informs was the spectator of the mobile scene. The beauty and the ceaseless miracle left in view of the unmanifest. 
the form of this everlasting move in it, seeking its own perfect form in souls and things. Life kept no more a dull and meaningless shape. Thank you. So he can see this spirit that's hidden in all these apparently material, unconscious material forces and forms. And that he's aware that that spirit is watching all this movement, keeping it in existence, perhaps also keeping it in order, in harmony, by looking at it, this mobile scene. And then he sees all this beauty, the ceaseless miracle of the universe, and it even allows to penetrate through it a glow of what has not been manifested, which has never been manifested so far. No? And in all that, the formless everlasting, the eternal, bodiless, formless, nameless, is moving in it, but it's seeking for its own perfect form in souls and things. That's what's really going on. The everlasting is seeking from us that uh, development of its own perfect form. So life, of course, no longer had a, a dull and meaningless shape. It has a much, much profounder and more miraculous significance. <coughs> Mila. The external and the hero of the world, he saw the name of the world as a secret knowledge must assume the past. Faith covered with an unseen necessity, the game of chance of an incomplicated dream. Mm. So, all the struggle and upheaval of the world, all the disorder that is so painful to us, he sees that this is like a woman giving birth the labor giving birth to a God, to a divine being. He saw that uh, all this appearance of ignorance is actually just a disguise covering a secret knowledge. What we see as fate, as the determinisms that govern the material world is actually also just a disguise hiding this unseen necessity. The world has to evolve like this because some intention has been um, placed in it from the very beginning. No? So it may look like a game of chance but actually, it's all following the purpose of an all-powerful will and intention. I think we'll stop there for today. The inspiring goddess entered a mortal's breast, made there her study of divining thought and sanctuary of prophetic speech, and sat upon the tripod seat of mind. All was made wide above, 
all lit below. In darkness core she dug out wells of light. On the undiscovered depths imposed a form, lent a vibrant cry to the unuttered vasts, and through great shoreless, voiceless, starless breaths bore earthward fragments of revealing thought hewn from the silence of the ineffable. A voice in the heart uttered the unspoken name. A dream of seeking thought wandering through space entered the invisible and forbidden house. The treasure was found of a supernal day. In the deep subconscient glowed her jewel lamp. Lifted, it showed the riches of the cave where, by the miser traffickers of sense unused, guarded beneath night's dragon paws, in folds of velvet darkness draped, they sleep, whose priceless value could have saved the world. A darkness carrying morning in its breast looked for the eternal wide returning gleam waiting the advent of a larger ray and rescue of the lost herds of the sun. In a splendid extravagance of the waste of God, dropped carelessly in creation's spendthrift work, left in the shantiers of the bottomless world and stolen by the robbers of the deep, the golden shekels of the eternal lie, hoarded from touch and view and thought's desire, locked in blind antres of the ignorant flood, lest men should find them and be even as God. A vision lightened on the viewless heights, a wisdom illumined from the voiceless depths, a deeper interpretation greatened truth, a grand reversal of the night and day, all the world's values changed, heightening life's aim, a wiser word, a larger thought came in than what the slow labor of human mind can bring. A secret sense awoke that could perceive 
a presence and a greatness everywhere. The universe was not now this senseless whirl born round inert on an immense machine. It cast away its grandiose, lifeless front, a mechanism no more a work of chance, but a living movement of the body of God. A spirit hid in forces and in forms was the spectator of the mobile scene. The beauty and the ceaseless miracle let in a glow of the unmanifest the formless everlasting moved in it, seeking its own perfect form in souls and things. Life kept no more a dull and meaningless shape. In the struggle and upheaval of the world, he saw the labour of a Godhead's birth. A secret knowledge masked as ignorance. Fate covered with an unseen necessity. The game of chance of an omnipotent will. 